Hey folks, this is Greg Lokers and Mike Rippey with Scapegoat. Uh, we're going to be looking at the work of Khaldun Hijazin, um, particularly his solo show titled The Cherry on Top. Um, Khaldun is a Jordanian painter, and uh, I think that this, these paint, well, it's interesting that he's called a painter when he makes sculptures as well. Um, and uh, I went to school with Khaldun. We were in the same graduating program at the School of Museum of Fine Arts. Um, so I'm excited just from having not seen Khaldun in a while and seeing his work and really loving it. Um, so this is the bulk of the body of work in this show. And I wanna show one thing that he, he featured on Instagram like all good artists do shots from the opening and they give us a little sense of how the work is displayed, particularly that sculpture in the middle of the space and how it interacts, the, the two sculptures interact with the rest of the work. So, and then this is a, a plug for following him on Instagram, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so sh I think I'll go through the images so we can see them a little bit larger. Um, these paintings are pretty big. So like this is 138 and 5 eighths inches wide or 352 centimeters. Um, why is that making it smaller? Anyways. Khaldun really has some amazing painting chops. You really get some interesting imagery. I want to show he has this on his Instagram as well, a close up of this painting where you can see the ways in which he's letting the material of the paint work with the canvas in interesting ways. So you can see those those blotches and whatnot are like stains on the um, on the canvas itself. I love the, the mix of like textures in the backgrounds along with very good and rigorous figurative painting. Some sort of bowing chair. Mm -hmm. And then the, the cake, which it's interesting to see the way like each layer is balanced on these pillars that have very Western Greco-Roman kind of appeal to them. And then in the shot of the installation, it looked like there were two of those pillars were also placed on the floor. How tall is this thing? 51 inches tall. It's, it's awesome. Big sculpture. So do any of those images jump out to you, Mike? Is yeah, I like the chandelier image. I like the banana image. I mean, I there's a lot. I like a lot of them. Um, scroll down some more. Let me see if there's one that. I like the cake sculpture and the chair and that circle on the floor. I think go to the top. Uh, so that's the goat one on the right. Uh huh. So almost all of them. Those are the ones that really jump out to me as well. There's kind of, in my opinion, I'm seeing like two different things happening. One is the faces especially the ones that have the, the yeah we need to talk about one of those too yeah on the faces but then there's these other ones that are like this is cutting off the faces cutting off the faces and this one in particular is is cutting off the faces as well it's almost like he's got the ones that are faces and then the ones that are about bodies and placement in space 
and I'm, I'm, and then this is an interesting kind of in between. Mm -hmm. No face, just a body. Maybe that's the bridge between. Because part of it, I was kind of wondering, thinking of it as like two separate entities that are. They, they're definitely related, but they're quite different. And then maybe this is the bridge piece, but let's look at these pieces first. I'll subscribe to our mailing list, of course. Um, so yeah, this one you talked about a little earlier and you talked about how he has a really great handle on um, technique. And it just, I mean, that rug is amazing as far as like the technical skill to create that um you could just see the wear and tear in the rug also just from where it's been walked on and the you know the pile has been kind of squished down um but you know you also mentioned before we started that it's about kind of the degradation of kind of western culture also but it's it also comes across as kind of a very human thing, you know, just, it's just kind of a basic thing that, you know, there's potential for a chandelier to come crashing down and, and make kind of like the spectacle. And then you see the people standing around and, you know, no one luckily is injured, but like, they're just kind of, no one's doing anything. <laughs> Right. Well, and then there's so much that's being said about the clothing and the shoes. And then this person in the front who has like this one hand right here to me is really important because that's the politician hand. You know what I'm talking about? The yeah. like, It's like stern showing power, but it's also not like a fist, that little thumb on top. And then this booklet that seems to be rolled up in the hand and I wonder if some of the things on the ground are not just glass, if one of them is a booklet or if they're the can like they're candles from the mm -hmm. ch chandelier. But I wonder if some of it, it, it has this sense of like wealthy people gathered around um, a catastrophe, but they're all still like, aside from this, this one set of hands we see here, I imagine all of the other hands have shrimp cocktails and other right. wine and they're they're stewing around watching this thing and perhaps even like betting or bidding or doing something you know like what kind of information is in that pamphlet it looks like an auctioneer's it looks like the thing you get at one of at like a Sotheby's auction in order to like think about what's happening and it's just so it's just so weirdly posh it makes me think about like you know, the Banksy's getting, getting shredded and how it's like ostensibly what Banksy was supposedly trying to do was make a comment on the consumerist nature and the commodification of art objects. And yet in do doing so, he made a more expensive commodity for very, very wealthy people to trade off of, so to speak. And to me, it's that kind of thing of like, we would think of the chandelier falling as this horrific event, but if you're in a particular place, it actually can be something that is valuable, something to, to watch. It, it reminds me of, uh, uh, who was it? I think it was Dostoevsky who talked about, um, you know, if we, if we actually achieve the utopian society that so many of us desire, the first thing we do is smash it to bits. <laughs> It's like that's that's what yeah that's that's what I'm seeing here. Like you just said, you know, they're kind of just standing around, just watching it. And so this idea of Western culture or Western society become you know just breaking apart. You know, these people are participating in that. They're there at this event, and this this happens, and they don't do anything to fix it. They just stand there and watch it. So it's you know it's it's the destruction of something at their pleasure, you know? So it's not a concern. It doesn't become a concern to these people. It's something they're completely, you know, in apathy for this. They don't care. Right. They're just going to watch it destroy. Like you said, they're probably a bunch of very wealthy people. So they're concerned over one, you know, oh, one chandelier is busted, you know, no big deal. We'll move on to the next one. Yeah. So it's, it's, just, it's, you know, it's kind of gross, but at the same time, it's, uh, you know, in this kind of world, like what else, 
I guess, would you expect them to do? I mean, they're so detached from, you know, from participating in anything so, you know, debasing as cleaning up a broken chandelier that none of them really do anything but just stand there. Yeah, it's like turning it into a game or something. I think about like in the background, there are two, we can see a hint of a potted plant right here. And then we get the base of a potted plant. And I just think about that, like the idea of domestication or like something like something that might be said at a lot of auctions or museums is like for your viewing pleasure. And I just think about that, like that is so, you know, like I can hear the voice of the auctioneer in this situation being like, you know, and here's, here's our next lot for your viewing pleasure. And it's just like, Hmm. Oh, you know, you hear the chatter and like, you can, you can even like see the coupling up and the sort of conversations that might be having being had around this thing. No one is jumping back. No one's fallen to their feet. It's like this thing, even if it, if the chandelier just fell, it did not surprise anyone. And now all it is, is like another thing to gawk at and, and sort of uh, jockey for position socially to see, you know, what, what do, it's like by looking at the art, they're figuring out things about their peers. The art is sort of a, a you know, the, the object in the middle, the chandelier, the painting is just a way for us to figure out where we stand in relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I mean, just imagine if there was a shot or a, a depiction of somebody actually doing something to kind of like start cleaning up or just picking the pieces up. I mean, that person, in contrast to these other people, would seem much more moral and ethical. Mm. You know, while they stand around and watch, there's actually somebody doing something to, to, to be helpful, you know? Right. So, you know, these people don't could care less about the chandelier or, you know, the, like I said, the, the devaluing or, you know, the devolving of Western culture. So, right. And it's just another event. <laughs> this is making me think about what is the etymology of chandelier? Um, Cause I think about it, like, like my mind immediately goes to, you know, highly ornate source of light that hangs up above. It's circular in nature, which is sort of about infinity. It's decorated. Like I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how much of this is related I mean, to sorts of images of he heaven or images of the ideal. And then the yeah, I mean, it had, definitely has like royalty feel to it. I mean, it looks like a crown on the top of the chandelier. I mean, I don't know what it would look like closer in in person, but. Yeah. It definitely has this idea of kind of royalty or monarchy. And maybe that's part of it too, is this idea of, you know, uh, if you get, want to get all French revolution, you know, the destruction of the monarchy over the, you know, the bureaucracy, you know, that kind of thing. The bureaucracy in effect is so slow moving. It feels like they're doing nothing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I found something interesting in just a quick Google search, which so, you know, fact check me on this um according to some armenian orthodox website the chandelier frequently symbolizes god's mercy over the faithful as unending you know mm. like a light in the darkness which is interesting it's almost like it makes sense that like star-like shape and the fact that all of that they're always filled with glass and light and all of this it's like a galaxy in and of himself and for it to be ever present overhead really like bringing in some Nietzsche here of like the, the death of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Bringing in all, all forms of very uh, refined individuals. This one where I'm starting to look at like the, the details of it. Like I can't figure out what is happening right behind the chandelier. If that is like a, it looks like it might be a podium or some kind of sign. Uh, do you think it's an auctioneer's lectern? I guess it could be. And then there's a gentleman wearing like a, a raincoat. Yeah. Transient. Yeah. There's some sort of crutch over on the right. Yeah, I noticed ah. that too. I want to see this painting in person. 
we should slide it to buy. <laughs> should we move on to one of the, the next sure. ones? I think, yeah, this one. Hmm. The, the banana peel thing is always just a gag for me. So it's, to me, this is more of a joke. Mm. It's, it's not even a real event in my mind. It's almost like theater. So, and I guess that could go along with the idea of something like this being theater, the, you know, procession down some, you know, aisle of people and you're looking at royalty or whatever, but like that's, a, that's theater also. But to me, this almost feels like you're kind of caught in between something that's documenting a joke and something that's documenting some kind of royal event. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, those processions, I, I was thinking about this painting and how like, uh, you know, these, these two royal figures are walking forward. But if you think about the space, they didn't come from that wall. You know, there's no door right. behind them. So what that means is that they have walked from the sides to come together to proceed down some sort of most likely aisle or, you know, into the center of a room for some sort of, you know, you know, how they do at the, all the fancy things of welcome, you know, announcing people's entrance. Right. So there's some degree of, there's such a, such a degree of like a, a very, um, a very fake procession that is set up in order to glorify these individuals and the status that they carry, which then, you know, immediately we start thinking about all of the trappings, especially the, the decoration of what the woman is wearing and its contrast to the wall behind it, the sash, the gloves, the, the little, I think that's considered a garter belt that is on the man's leg, though that could be wrong. It might be a, a, like a, a sheath for, a decorative dagger or something like that, but I don't know all of the terms for that fancy clothing. So to me, I think like you're right, like in that whole theater kind of, it's like if the banana wasn't there, I'm covering it with my thumb. It's like suddenly I'm like, oh, this is a serious painting about royal processions. And then the banana is there and it's like, no, actually this is a joke. Like royal processions are a joke. And it's like, why does the banana, why is it necessary for me to see the banana for me to think that that thing is a joke? Right, right. That's you know, a good like, point, too. It might just be a joke, even if there is no banana there. Yeah. <laughs> and then the dirtiness of the canvas. That's where I, I'll go back to the to Instagram. I think I can actually, yeah, like those details mm -hmm. on the canvas. Like he's, oh, he's, yeah. you know, he's so good at handling paint and making it, lustrous and smooth and the logic of all of the paint handling and then just the like the like pox so to speak yeah and it looks all soiled and like yeah. oil was dripped on it or something yeah or it just wasn't kept in a proper storage <laughs> right right yeah it was not cared for Or, or it grew that way, you know, it makes me, it almost kind of links it to like the portrait of Dorian Gray kind of idea of like their trappings and the way they look is very beautiful, but the state of their soul, like the painting of Dorian Gray is corrupt um, and, is, and is like growing boils and, and blemishes. It's also odd compared to the, fir the first painting we looked at is that the first painting looked more like an accident, you know, and, yeah. and something more unintentional, whereas the banana is intentional. I mean, it's there on purpose. Somebody put it there. And so this, I mean, it looks like an accident could be coming. I mean, that's the idea that you're going to slip on the banana peel. Yeah. But to me, it's more... Like the, the accidental, you know, ignoring the state of things and having it fall apart around you versus making a joke out of something, you know, because these two people are serious people from how it's being represented. 
and they're not wanting to be involved in some kind of silly joke. I mean, they are, obviously, they're walking right towards the banana peel without stopping. But the other one was more like just watching something slowly decay. So I guess in some ways they are the same because they're intentionally a part of the joke, you know? So they're still wanting to see some something bad happen from their stat from their status or from the culture that they're in. So they're yeah. participating in it now versus before they were it's kind of like something just happened and they were reflecting on it. Now they're actually participating in making a mockery of themselves. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so this one, it's, it's a little more confusing for me because um, the, the goat is definitely a religious symbol in my mind, especially, you know, based on our organization as scapegoat. So yeah. I, I instantly go to the whole idea of what the scapegoat is in the Bible, which is the uh, releasing of sins into this goat and then releasing it into the wilderness. Um, Do you think that's a goat? It looks like a goat. I kind of think it's a sheep. It could be a sheep. Either way, there's very similar connotations. Yeah, this it's similar. It's all they're always a sacrifice. Even you know we're supposed to be the sheep on some level, but then sheep are also sacrificed as well as goats, and so it's a very odd dynamic. But right. uh, yeah, the idea that that these animals can release sin in some way is just an odd thing. Um, well, and you get these like that that image of the sheep or goat is like you know we've got bare feet we've got hands that look worked and are also are held in a all all three of the hands in that part of the composition are held in a like uncomfortable manner like like the the hand hands that are used to working and don't know what to do with themselves in this idle moment where it's as if we're getting a snapshot of you know like the the folks on the farm which are dressed in a very com compared to the rest are dressed in a very european peasant kind of style is like you know idleness is not good then we have in the middle and on the left this kind of um european perhaps military uniform, but also it, it smacks of those images of like the, the Western Europeans on safari kind of safari outfit with the mm -hmm. military style boots and everything, the hand grasping the gun with the dog, the hunting dog at the ready kind of thing. And then just this very, very delicate hands preparing the food for eating accented by the guy in the middle whose body is replaced by a strange off-kilter wedding cake. Right. And then set inside this kind of abstract <laughs> um, background. Yeah, like kind of maro background colors that are stained. <laughs> Right. It's like a weird, it's like a scrapbook photo album, especially with yeah. the yellow and red squares. This is the painting that is the title of the show, the cherry on top. But where's the cherry? I don't see the cherry unless it's the color. No, I don't see. That's the thing is there's no cherries in the entire show. I think it's the, the cherry on top. Uh, see, I'm trying, I'm trying to formulate what I think the whole show is about, because I think I have some ideas of like what some of the paintings are about. Maybe we should come back to this one. Let's come okay. back to this one, and I want to look at, what were the other, we already looked at that one. Maybe we should talk about this. Okay. And then that bridge piece. Because this sculpture, like, uh, I mean, I feel like how, how much art history do I want to talk about? Um, <laughs> you know, the, the cake as structure, as a, the layer cake, is obviously relating to things like coliseums and other buildings 
which get their names, you know, we say like the first story, the second story, the third story of a building, because what we're talking about is bands of visual stories that you can literally put on the walls. And so a one story building means you can put one level of stories on imagery around the wall. The second a two story building means there's two stories that can go around as in actual narratives. And then on top of that, these cakes are always modeled after, you know, like the decorations of architecture, mostly European architecture, which comes from the decoration of temples. And so it's like when we build a cake, a wedding cake in particular, it's like we're making an edible, beautiful temple-like structure that reaches to the heavens like a Tower of Babel. And then Khaldun continues to emphasize that by including actual architectural elements, pillars that are toppling to different degrees and causing it to stay off balance. But the thing is, is that this sculpture should fall over, but knowing you know, it's made out of fiberglass and the artist, obviously it doesn't suit the artist for it to be destroyed necessarily, or it appears not to, it's artificially being held up by the fact that it's, it's not actually a cake and it's not actually falling over. It's just creating the imagery of a cake falling over. So it's like artificial propping up of a thing that is meant to give us pleasure. And it's not the real thing. It's even like cakes are so fake. They're, they're like fake food. I think it's like Jim Gaffigan has some joke about cake being sugar bread. And then we like to serve sugar bread with frozen sugar milk. It's <laughs> like, there's such, it's such a fake food. Like you cannot live on cake, which is like why, you know, the whole famous Marie Antoinette quote is so powerful and interesting. It has resounded through history. It's just this, we all know that cake is such a joke for food. It's this extreme extravagance. And then to make a cake that is falling over. But it's interesting the way it's falling over because like you said, it has the little decorative pieces on the cake parts. Are They seem more like neoclassical kind of, you know, more um, contemporary than the columns. Like the columns look like Greek columns. They don't look like older kind of Roman columns. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, and they don't seem, they seem to be kind of, destroying the cake like almost they're coming like they're just materializing out of the cake and starting to knock it over and it's almost like a call back to like the old ways or kind of taking over this kind of neoclassical you know buffoonery of this wedding cake you know that's that's mm. you know like you said just sugar and and purely for pleasure so it's like the old is kind of destroying the new is kind of how i see it also mm. um or they're destroying each other. So maybe the maybe those little those little columns were holding each platform up, and then it's starting to fall over from the weight or whatever. But it's to me, yeah, it's definitely this idea of going back to the whole idea of the degradation of Western culture is that it can't sustain itself in some way. Either the old is destroying the new, or everything is just collapsing upon itself. Well, but then it's frozen mid collapse. Yeah. And presented as something for us to behold, so to speak, like that chandelier. Right. Of, you know, the chandelier has hit the ground, but it's not completely decimated. And then it's like, behold. And then this piece is titled the tower of desire. And it's like this unsustainable desire that we know is toppling and yet it's what we desire. It's like, it, it has, there's this effect of a lot of the work where it's like watching it or like driving by a car wreck. Like we all have to look, we have to see. And, but this is more like, it's all the videos, right? All of the videos of the accidents that are happening. It's like the accident is currently happening and we all just want to watch it for our own viewing pleasure. We want to stand back and be safe. But it's this, it's this tragedy. But you also mentioned, <laughs> yeah, you also mentioned that when Khaldun first came to graduate school, that he 
was very interested in more traditional art forms and that you know you were challenged in your mfa program and you mentioned that he was challenged on some level also and i just wonder if it's is he still you can still see that he really enjoys traditional art and uh wants to celebrate it even in its destruction so it's almost like the pressures you know on him to see the end of western civilization and move past the things that he really enjoyed you know and and wanting to see these things fail in some way you know whether it's you know something that he reflected on in graduate school or if it's the pressures that our society wants to bear on Western culture is that, you know, there are many people that want to see Western culture fail naturally, you know, just th that's what they want to see happen. And so it's, it's almost, mm -hmm. you know, the influences that we're exposed to even in, you know, art programs or, you know, different, the, the different people that we meet, you know, how much influence they really have over our art production and, and then it goes back to the idea that, you know, you are who you surround yourself with. So, you know, it's kind of a nice little lesson that maybe you need to be a little more, you need to protect yourself on some level as Christians also, you are who you surround yourself with. So if you don't have a strong faith, be careful who you spend your time with. Mm. If you, if you have a strong faith and you feel like you can venture out and, and start having conversations with people and be more maybe evangelical, you know, even then you still have to be patient. And, you know, we talked about this, we talked about this recently, like how far can you go in to a situation that could, could harm you and how much do you, this was the conversation we had with Peter. How far can you go into a situation before it's, before you can't get out of it? And so those are things that you have to consider, you know, as probably as an artist and as a Christian and as a believer is like, how far can you go down that rabbit hole before you can't get yourself out of it? So mm -hmm. it's interesting that this artwork is playing off that, those thoughts that we had right. talking well, to that's another a, that's gallery an, owner. That's an interesting, um, that's an interesting way to think about even, you know, regardless of what your principles are, we all have ideologies that guide us, whether they're religious or they're philosophical. And, and so I think about this, even, you know, taking it as an artist, so many of us are like, I mean, you know, th this is a, this website is a gallery and we're seeing the price of this work. Most artists can't even afford their own artwork. I don't know Caldoun's particular financial situation, but like this is well-priced priced artwork. And, I think about that like, like he loves Velasquez as he should, as someone mm -hmm. who's interested in traditional craftsmanship of painting. Velasquez is a master and handles paint wonderfully. And you can see that influence in what Caldoun's doing. And that's where it's like talking about the cake toppling. We, I mean, not everyone loves cake, but like everyone loves sugar. And obviously, you know, if you don't like cake, you could place in any other sweet, unhealthy food, but we all love treats. We all love dessert. And yet we know it's bad for us. And yet we want it. And yet we also kind of want it to go away. Like I think about the times when like someone brings me sweets and I'm like, I already had dessert today or I, or I had, you know, ice cream yesterday. And I'm like, I want this to go away, but I also want it. That to me is like the dance back and forth of this entire show. If we look at just the whole thing is like, I want to sit in that chair, but I also agree that that chair is like over the top. Do we really need these massive chairs that like communicate? They're like our own, everyone gets their own little throne to sit on as if we're our own king or queen. We all put on our tuxedos for, for certain events, depend, you know, obviously not every human being, but lots of us are able to have this level of opulence and extravagance this this whole show makes me think about i think someone coined the term like american american extravagance instead of american 
exceptionalism. It was American extravagance. And this kind of extravagance of the West, even in, you know, like something like this image, the juxtaposition of Middle Eastern cultures eating, I, I think that's on rugs, but it also might be outdoors. It's kind of hard to tell at this size mm -hmm. and scale. And then Westerners in nice dress with China, tablecloths and food. Right. But see, this is to me, let's leave it here for a second, because this is the juxt this is the thing that we we argue about most in our society. People feel people want to look at something and think that so the uh, the American, you know, images in here or the re more refined, you know, that's the stuff that we want to argue about. You know, these people, for whatever reason, decided that they wanted a table with tablecloth and these nice candle holders and their little smoking pipes and their cups and things like that. Now, that's fantastic that they like that stuff, but they the, the, the contrast is the picture in the background where it looks like there's is it like a sacrifice situation? I can't or even remember. I think it's a feast. I think it's okay. some so if, if it's even if it's a feast, even if it's like a play on the two, you know, contrasting views, there's nothing, you know, we are the ones that apply this exceptionalism to things, you know, that the, the, the scene in the background is as legitimate to me as the scene in the, the two images on either side. It's just these are preferences people have. You know, he's outside, you know, and having this feast, it's, you know, the fact that it's like this contrast is the part, the thing that people want to get all stoked up about all the time. I respect the people in the background as much as I respect the people in the foreground. But there are people that are, you know, intent on making these, these differences into good or bad moral right. situations, and they're not at all. Right. Well, and that's interesting too to think about it because the painting's titled Middle Feast, which may obviously makes you think about Middle East. He's from Jordan. It's in the Middle East. We all know the the strange history of the Middle East over, you know, all of human history, but especially beginning in the 19th century and through the 20th and now into the 21st, of this kind of pressure of being between the East and the West, of being its own thing by itself, and of being a place that is in constant, a constant state of tumult and, and conflict at some point in time. Like there, there's, there's never an area that seems, like the whole area as a whole, if you take all of the Middle East, there seems to never be a moment where there is no conflict. There's some degree. And that's where I think, I think that makes sense of the case it makes sense of like all of this because as an artist you're also in a place where you're in some degree of conflict where you're like how do you make a painting like think going back to the reference i made of banksy how do you make a work of art that is uncommodifiable in order to critique the insanity of the art world and the way in which we are expending extravagant sums of money since the 1990s in particular on even living artists whose work we don't know if it will survive the test of time. And so Banksy creates a, a, a manner in which he can destroy his artwork after it's been purchased and it fails and it further feeds that system. It's like you could, you could see Banksy stuck in the same situation of being like, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. I need this right. system to exist. I need to like, Art, making art costs so much money. Canvas costs money. Paints cost money. It takes so much time. I think about that all the time. The amount of hours spent on dead-end projects in my studio and the amount of repainting and all of that that someone like Khaldun has to go through. It's like, you know, people see this, this price tag, like, okay, so this is a, a, a pretty large painting for $9,000 you got to realize the artist is going to get 50% of that most likely. I don't know what Dubai's uh, standards are, but in general, the uh, standard here in America is a 50-50 split. So the artist gets $4,500. You think about the hours that go into it, let alone the hours of failed work, which we would call that in, in other 
modes of, be, of, of uh, production, we call that research and development costs. And so now you're looking at hours and hours, like maybe Caldoun's getting paid 20 bucks an hour, if that, mm -hmm. to paint something like this. And then on top of that, the fact that unless you're a real superstar, not all of the paintings will sell. So now it's, it's just, it's this insane thing of like, you are stuck in the middle between commodification as a necessary evil and the hope of producing something that will be meaningful to people. And, and I think at the same time, like you're talking about, like both, both of these scenarios, the uh, sort of classically Western dining room table, it's filled with things from other cultures. Like literally we call the cups and the plates China because they are modeled after porcelain work that comes from China. And then you have the, the issues of a lot of the royalty of the Middle East embracing Westernism because they see the way in which they will be benefited from it, especially monetarily. It's just like, uh, no one is innocent. And the, yeah, the, it, it, he, I think he portrays it in an interesting way here with this sort of like photo book collage kind of thing. And going back to like the show as a whole, you know, painting your face, losing your head. Putting the painting on of the faces is interesting. I, I we haven't really talked about those yet, but uh, that's those are kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if there's some some message that I'm not aware of with painting of the faces that maybe the artist is more like, maybe it's a cultural thing, I'm not sure. But the idea of kind of washing your face out with a different color, um, I mean, it makes them look more plastic and less real. So maybe that's, I mean, that's the idea of putting a mask on. Um, yeah, I think it's masking. Yeah. There's so much about it of like, so much about this show is this struggle back and forth between things like artifice, extravagance, wealth, power, money. And it's like, Caldu doesn't say burn it all. To me, it's more a measured look at something like, we have to pick and choose and we have to be careful. And you have to understand the implications of how you eat a meal or something like that, because you might go too extreme and you might become this crazy, out of touch, extremely wealthy person, which probably arguably you could say all of us Americans are in particular. Right, there's nobody that's really poor in this country unless you're living out on the street. I mean, there's right. this idea of poverty in America is to me has become absurd. Um, I mean, there are people that intentionally live on the street, whether it's from mental illness that they are, feel like they're forced to be there or whatever. But, you know, I, growing up in a mobile home, you know, I never felt like I was poor. And I knew, you know, when you watch television or they talk about third world countries, I knew I wasn't in a third world country, you know, so I didn't, I knew I didn't have the, the, the poor, I wasn't poor in the way that they were poor. So things like that, you know, that's, and that's another issue also is the idea that people don't talk to the people that are actually living in those conditions. So there's, you know, the idea that these, that poor people are all these miserable people that have no hope is kind of absurd when you're upper middle class or extremely wealthy, you know? So it's, it's, and you know, you talk about white savior complex or people like to talk about that. And it's the same, but it's the same thing with the poor, you know, it's the rich savior complex. And, you know, it's like all these different things that people, because they haven't had that experience, just assume that if they're not having the same experience you are, that you're suffering in some way. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's where this image of the peasantry with the sheep and the barefootedness, the worked hands, I think it's the moment in the show that gets me towards this idea of what do, what do I think the cherry on top is and what do I think Cal Noon thinks the cherry on top is. And I think it's some degree of what you're saying of like, 
it's a bittersweet cherry. It's a like, my God, look at how far the world has come from these uh, horrific peasant-like conditions, largely. Obviously, that exists in large portions of the world, unfortunately. But then also, like, how do you counterbalance that with the extreme oppression of a very limited, wealthy class of people? Especially when it's, it's, it's uh, sort of monopolized by a few different countries or a, a single stratus of individuals. And to me, the cherry on top is that it's like, there's no easy solution. There's, it's, or, or the cherry on top is that there's salvation. You know, that all these people in these images, it, no matter how they're represented, are going to die. They're going to be dead, whether you're a peasant, you know, living in, you know, on the land, or you're this woman cutting, you know, nicely cutting appropriately her, you know, piece of, you know, steak or whatever it is, you know, in the end, they're all going to the same place. <laughs> hmm. So it's, it's, and that's, that's the, one of the things that troubles me the most is that, that people seem to want to spend their time being frustrated with culture and, you know, the haves and the have nots and things like that. And they don't, they take their eye off the, the ball, which is, you know, their salvation. So, so, you know, I, as, as much as I enjoy seeing the contrasts, it, to me, it's, it's, Sometimes it's just overly manufactured. The fact that you can't just enjoy things for what they are, you know, is frustrating. And I'm sure Khaldun has probably experienced that as well. You know, he can't just simply enjoy, you know, his culture. He has to have it constantly contrasted against something else, usually the West, you know, so it's, that's got to be frustrating because pe that's all people want to do is make these uh, comparisons and not just respect things for what they are. Because mm. yeah, each one yeah. of these scenes, I enjoy, you know, but it's together, it feels like they're trying to make a statement that somehow one is not as good as the other or somehow is lacking potentially. I mean, I, I can actually kind of see the respect between all three of these now that, you know, we're talking about it, that I'm talking about it in this way. Yeah. The, the center image is a little disruptive for me and I'm not sure, I mean, that might be more about Khaldun. That might be Khaldun representing himself in some way. And maybe there's some conflict with him with these three images together you know what i mean like this is because maybe he feels like he's the cake you know like maybe he feels like he's sugary and it's it's artificial somehow mm, that's interesting see i think that i think you're right to read it that he is equalizing a lot of these situations and putting them on the same level and saying at least in this painting, I see, I don't know about the shame yeah. yet, but in, in this painting, I think there's a lot of like, all of it is just as relatively hopeless. And I think about that central image, I'm going to read it as a hunter because of the image on the left with the dog mm -hmm. of like, the idea of the trophy hunter is such an extreme opulence. At the same time, I am very happy that I live in a world where I do not have to go out hunting every day in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that that sort of relic of all cultures had to hunt, every human being has a history embedded in us of having to go out and find our food and kill it in order to survive. The fact that now we can view it as extravagant as a wedding cake is both good and sad and that's what i mean by like the cherry on top is bittersweet to me it's like i don't think that if you had told you know someone in the 1400s that the world would get to a place where there were places where the average lifespan was upwards of 75 i think that that would be unbelievable mm -hmm. and it would be like that must be heaven 
And here we are in that heavenly place. And we're like, wow, this is shitty. <laughs> that's yeah, that's what I mean. It's like something has happened. And I don't know if it's just American culture. It could be, you know, European or Middle Eastern or Far East or whatever. But uh, our culture just seems very just sad, you know, all the time. Yeah. And it's, I don't know how to get us out of that. I don't understand this. This is what we're doing. Well, this is the only the thing drum. that makes us happy. The only thing that makes us happy is some form of destructive chaos that we can take pleasure in the destruction of something else. Yeah. And we're just ap completely apathetic about it. We just stand there and just watch it. And we don't, you know, it's, so, you know, you and I've talked about this in the past, like something's got to give at some point, it's got to kind of get away from all this stuff. And different people have this uh, different ideas of like this, um, what is it called? Perfect world. Yeah. And uh, it's never going to happen. So you need to find solace in something else, which is your salvation and life after death. And you know what I mean? So, but people are so, they think that they're going to create heaven on earth. And it's just, that's just not in the cards, you know? And we're getting so, you know, we're so close. Like you said, we live to be 75 years old and that's fantastic. But we're all so miserable still. I think about this image in particular. I think about the, the chapter in the Brothers Karamazov after the Grand Inquisitor, which is, uh, for, for folks who don't know, it's, uh, well, it's a, a vehement argument about the absurdity of God. And some say it's the, the strongest argument ever made against God. And I agree with that. It's incredibly compelling. And the next chapter is about Father Zosima. And one could argue that it does or does not address the Grand Inquisitor. And the way in which it addresses it is that Fathers, if Father Zosima was in this scene, he would be the one who would start putting that chandelier back together, I think. He'd be the one who'd be cleaning it up. Even if no one was watching, he'd still clean it up. Right, that's a good point too. Yeah. Doing the right thing when no one's watching. <laughs>